You're listening to the West Side Podcast, a part of the LA International Church of Christ family of churches, worshiping God in LA since 1989. Okay, we're going to ceremoniously grab our offerings and we're going to bring them in the back. Thank you guys. Awesome job. Give it up for everybody. That was fantastic to see the, uh, just the commitment and the heart. Uh, and didn't Fadi do a fantastic job? What a great friend. Uh, really love that family. Um, you know, his whole family is just fantastic. So we are in part three of our series on good news. Good news. You know, we as Christians have something special to share, and it's not just information. We, well, here's what the good news is, and each of us has to figure out what is the good news for you. But see, good news is not just something that goes in your head that you, just th- that you just think about. Good news is usually an event that occurred that affects your life. Uh, if you're a Toronto Raptor fan, uh, there was good news. They won the first game of the series. You know, they were really happy. And most of us, I don't know, we're in California, probably Golden State Warrior fans, a lot of us here. But I'm a Laker fan, and I kind of don't want the same team to keep winning, so I kind of was happy that Toronto won. But, you know, things that are encouraging are news that play out into our lives, right? The Toronto Raptors winning, that's, that's news that plays out into our life because if you're a fan, you care about it. The Christian message is incredible news. It's fantastic news because it changes your life. For you today, is the message of Jesus and Christianity good news? What is it to you? Is it something that your life plays into that affects you and inspires you and moves you along? We're going to read today the third sign from the book of John, which is the story of how he heals a man who had been an invalid for 38 years by the pool. But I want us to understand that, see, the kingdom of heaven is near. Jesus says it's near, and he says, repent and believe the good news. The answers to life are available to you. God has come down, revealed himself to the human race, And said, I am installing a kingdom that is unlike the value system of this world. In Luke chapter 2, I love, of course, during Christmas season, we celebrate the birth of Jesus. But we celebrate the birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus every day. But I like how it says in Luke 2, it says, glory to God in the highest And on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests because he had sent his son to reorient our thinking. God has entered into life. This is not just a religion. This is news about something that changes all people's lives. So Jesus goes to a place of healing. Let's read the text together, and you know, please turn, I, it's a small font right there, so you're not going to be able to read the screen, but it looks like a newspaper article. I thought that was a cool, you know, way to do it, and Ken had it last week like that, so thank you. But you need to turn in your Bibles or scroll down to John chapter 5, and we're going to read together and talk a little bit about this, and the title of today's sermon is Mercy Triumphs. Mercy wins. So we read there. In John chapter 5, we'll begin in verse 1. It says, glory to God, I'm sorry, sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem, near the sheep gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. The word Bethesda actually means house of mercy. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? It's interesting as you look at the story that he goes to a place of healing 
He's been known for healing people. And it's filled with people that are blind, that are lame, that are paralyzed. And as we're going to continue to read the story, he is going to go ahead and heal one of the men. Somebody had been there for 38 years, a long time without change occurring in their life. And I often look at the text and I, I wonder, I think, you know, this is Jesus. He could have walked down there. I don't know. That, that's sort of a, a, a depiction of what was going on. I don't know how exactly accurate that was. I found it's a cool, they tried to make a movie of Jesus. And so this is a, it's close, all right? It's close to maybe it looked a little like that. I think there were probably a lot more people. The colonnades are, are, are these big, you know, uh, uh, sort of porticos where you, you, you can rest underneath. And I often wonder when I read this scripture, how come Jesus, you know, we know he could heal people. We, we read uh, last week, Ken talked about how just with a word, he could heal somebody far away. So certainly Jesus could have walked down there and been like, let me get your attention, everybody. All you blind, lame paralyzed, you're now healed. And he could have healed every single one of them right there. He had the power. So the question I have is, why, why did he pick the one guy amongst all these people? We, we, the scripture doesn't say a large crowd formed at that point. He kind of walked down. He was seeing what was going on. It says he learned. He was having some conversations with people. And I think what God is trying to say to us is that He's interested in us where we're at individually. He's interested in us when maybe we've been stuck in the same place for a long time. All of us can say we've been blind or lame or paralyzed in some spiritual, physical, emotional ways at one time or another in our life. Some of us are paralyzed by a life that we live that we are not happy with. And we don't know how to change it. A circumstance that we are not happy with and we're paralyzed. We don't know what to do. And Jesus knows about it. Jesus, I believe, goes to this man that had been an invalid for 38 years to help us understand that he's reaching each of us with his mercy, the house of mercy. You know, for me, I had a lot of good things going on in my life when I was 23 years old, so I thought, let me tell you a little bit about my, my life. That was my sports car. That was a 280ZX when I was in college. At 23, I was driving, had T-tops just like that. I thought, I, you know, back then that was cool. Now, actually, if it looked that good now, it'd probably be cool again because it'd be like vintage. <laughs> That's how I was driving around. I had gotten my degree. I had some stuff in life. I had a degree from UCLA. I was proud. Yeah, I, got, I graduated. I had purchased a VFR 700. looked exactly like that. And I was driving that around thinking I was really cool and I could go extremely fast on that. I was working in Century City at the Twin Towers right there. If you looked at my life, it didn't look like I was blind, lame, or paralyzed. But I was not well spiritually. And there was an aching feeling in my heart that something was missing. I was morally corrupt. My relationships didn't work. I knew I was seeking something that was empty. And I needed the mercy of God to come down and reach to me and reach out to me. I needed to be a part of this mercy house. I didn't realize it. And a lot of us here today, we're in, maybe we feel like, yeah, I've been blind. I need the truth. Maybe we feel paralyzed by our life that it's not changing or not growing or it's just not quite where we want it to be. Some of us, maybe we, we just come because we've always come to this church and, and we don't really feel like we have a need, but we do. Deep down we do and God notices and he sees us and he wants us to understand it. He wants us to respond. And so Jesus goes to this guy and he asks a question that we all need to ask honestly of ourselves. And we need to answer the question, do you want to get well 
Do you want to get well? Some of us were unaware that we need to get well. Some of us clearly feel like we do. So I want to keep reading a little bit here. In verse 7, Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. And I want us to think right now, have we asked the question of ourselves, do we want to get well? And can we say, yes, I want to get well. Jesus asked this guy because he'd been there for 38 years and hadn't changed. And so he, he naturally wants him to begin to look at the, 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 the motives of his heart. And here's the thing that's motivating to me. Jesus wants us to respond. We have a choice in whether or not we want to get well. we got to answer the question. If you notice, the guy never says, yes, I want to get well right now. He breaks right on into an excuse, right? Look what he says. He says, I, I have no one to help me into the pool. I have no one. Don't we say that sometimes? I have no one. You really, it's a feeling we tell ourselves. We pity ourselves. No one, no one understands my situation. I have no one. You ever, asked, you ever said that about yourself? I, you had to, right? All, at some point, we feel in our inner being this emotional sense of my life stinks right now and no one understands it. And that thought is a complete lie. People do understand the pain you're going through. You may not believe it or know anybody individually that you think understands it, but let me tell you this, there is nothing new under the sun. The emotional pain that you are suffering, people understand it. Many in our world today live quiet lives of desperation. And they can feel like no one gets me, no one understands me. It's an epidemic of faithlessness. Our world is not designed to build your faith. My precious nine-year-old son, Nathan, we encourage him. I'm, I'm tough on him at times, probably too tough on him at times, I think. I want him to develop character, but I believe in him enormously. The teachers believe in him enormously. But he has this never-ending thought of negativity running through his mind. I can't do it. I'm not going to pass the, the, the grade. I, I'm not going to do it. Things aren't going to work out. I'm not going to succeed. Y you ever been there? Why, why? Our culture sends this teaching across the airwaves. We're not going to make it. We're not going to succeed. We can't do it. No one understands me. And it's a lie. You know where lies come from? Satan. John 8, verse 44 says, The devil is a liar and the father of lies. There are spiritual forces they exist, and now that the media is everywhere, the media can be used for good. And let me tell you, spiritual forces of darkness use it for bad. And negativity floats through the airways all the time. They lie to us. They tell us we can't, no one, we can't do it, we're not going to change. And Jesus asked him, do you want to get well? And, and he breaks into these excuses. Now, if you notice, he doesn't pat him on the back and say, they're there. Poor boy. He gets right to the issue, and he, he goes ahead and he heals him right there on the spot. There was a glimmer in him. He wouldn't have been sitting by the pool. But Jesus wanted to ask him to really evaluate where he was at. He doesn't give us self-pity. He calls us to answer the question in the affirmative. Yes, I want to get well. I want to evaluate where I'm at, and I want to be transformed. All of us need to just throw off the lie that we got to stay the way we are or circumstances got to stay the way they are or that no one understands this. I, I loved hearing, you know, Fatty sharing and just especially when he shared about how even when he showed up here, he felt like family. We have family. Jesus underwent all the things that we face. 
We all do struggle. We have hard times. We do get discouraged, but you're not the only one going through it, and we pick each other up. You need other people in your life, and you know, we, we have, there's countless recovery groups in the world because people understand, and there's support groups, people understand we do need to be told the truth that you're not the only one. And you know, if you've been through trauma, you understand the power of a support group. We need one another to uproot the lies so that we can actually get well. And Jesus, in this situation, he comes on and he says, all right. And then the next verse, let's go to the, my, my next point. And I want to have Justin come on up here in a minute. Where's Justin at? Come on out, Justin. All right. We see what he does. Jesus basically tells them very simply, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was the Sabbath. He says, get up. In, in Greek, it's igiro. It means to awaken, to, to rouse literally from sleep, from figuratively from obscurity or inactivity, to rise out of non-existence, to awake, to lift up, to get up and do something. Christianity is an outdoor sport. It's an action sport. It's something we do. It's not something we just talk about. And he gets up, and he picks up his mat, and he walks right there. He's cured. The power of Jesus, I don't, I don't understand how he was able to do that. Maybe the power of his word. I know the power of his word transformed me. Just hearing the word of God, reading the word of God, applying the word of God, and wow, my life transformed. I, all that out, external stuff I had, I, I have a uh, 2005 Chevy pickup truck now. And I'm far happier than I've ever been in my life because I have family and I have purpose. I have mission. Get up. Pick up your mat and walk. And you don't leave a back door, right? Pick up your mat. Clean it all up. Don't leave a back door where you can go back to. Do things thoroughly responsibly, completely, get about the business of making disciples. Read this verse recently in a Bible study. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. Whoa, that's the one that gets me almost every day. I'm like, oh, there's more I can do. I want to be a responsible, faithful disciple of Jesus. And that means laziness has got to go. Love has got to supplant laziness. And we got to get up and do something. Now here's the thing. A lot of us in our culture are churchgoers. And we're, all, most of us in here, most of you, if you're visiting today, we teach about being a disciple. We teach the great commission. Go and make disciples. I'm so fired up to have Justin Shump on our campus right now during the summer. He's our campus intern. He's fired up. Look at him there. UCLA shirt. And we got to make disciples on the campus. We got to make them over and over and over. We got to go for it. And so uh, I want to talk to Justin and give you a little modern day parable of how a lot of us think about these things. So I'm going to give Justin a mic. Justin, go out on those campuses and make disciples. Study with guys, baptize them, and teach them to obey. All right? Steve, that sounds... That sounds amazing. You know, I, I love that, sh that scripture you shared with us in Matthew 28 last week about going out and, and making disciples and baptizing them. And I just, I've been thinking about it ever since. You know, I, I've been so consumed in the words that you were saying. It was so powerful, really resonated with my inner being. It's almost like you had these spiritual darts, and my heart was the dartboard, and you were just hitting bullseye after bullseye after bullseye. Man, it just, I felt so good. I even went home, and I started a connect group. And we were just talking so much about how 
how awesome this idea uh, is of, of going out and, and making disciples, and we were all fired up, and we even we wrote this little song, go and make disciples of us, and we put a little two into it, and we've been singing it every single day. You know, I even, I took my phone, I made it my screensaver, that scripture, and so every time I see my phone, I, I look at it, and, and I see the scripture, because it just, it resonates with me so much, and I love just feeling that. I love feeling inspired. And I was, oh, I felt so good. So just thank you so much for making me feel so good and really giving me that charge. I've, I've been thinking about it so much. I just can't stop thinking about it. I love just thinking about it and seeing it. And man, it's just, I feel so good. Thank you so much, Steve. You guys get the point? <laughs> Justin, get up, take your mat, walk, and go make disciples. All right. Come on. Let's give it up for Justin. A lot of times that's how we are. We hear the word, we believe the word, and we hear the word, and we believe the word, and we talk about the word, and we think about the word, and we come up with ways to learn it even deeper, and we memorize it, we learn it in different languages, and we realize, man, it's so great. I love when people bring people to church. I love seeing when they do, and we think about it all the time, but we just don't do it. God's calling us, church, to change this world. We do it through giving. Thank you, church, for giving to mission. Thank you. It's going to produce fruit. You know, as a congregation, we have seen miracles. I want to see them again. Do you want to see them again? They happen one by one. They happen in your living room. They happen in your workplace. They happen on the campus step by step. They happen amongst people you love dearly because you're willing to reach out, allow some confrontation. You're willing to, to call people to get up, to get going, to make it happen. Faith creates an energy. Don't let the lies tear down your faith. As a congregation, it's time. It's time for us to say, all right, I, I, you know, if you notice, we moved the stage back a little today because we added a little bit more room, and I want us to, have to keep moving it back because we're lining the front with chairs. And, and just so you know, I love hearing Mark Shaw sing. I loved all the, Maisha up here singing, all the worship people singing. Service is getting better and better. God's word's being preached God is looking at individual lives. I was on campus this week sharing my faith. I, 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 I was shocked by how many people at UCLA are just agnostic, not really sure what they believe. Oh, they're in their master's program at Anderson School of Business. They're going to accomplish great things, probably make a lot of money, but they're going to be empty. They're going to be blind, lame, and paralyzed spiritually. And God allowed each one of us to have that aching part of us that says, yes, I want to connect. I want to know God, and I want to live for something bigger than the American dream, which I know you guys do. This guy was inspired by Jesus' words to get up and make a difference, and I want to call on us as a church to get up, to pick up our mat. Don't leave any back door. Let's dream for God to do some incredible things to change a lost world. And after this guy gets up and leaves, you know what happens? Here's, let's read the rest of this passage. All right, let's pick up here. It's very interesting what happens. Let's look in verse, um, verse 10 or verse 11. Or let's we'll, we'll pick up in the uh, second half of verse 9. It says, The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leader said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. I was actually in the Bible to carry no load on the, on the Sabbath. But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was. For Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. And it's interesting. He didn't create a big commotion to prove how great he was. He healed them individually, just like he's looking at your life individually to help you no matter how long you've been where you're at. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. 
So this is interesting. I mean, he didn't have to go back and tell him that, but why, why did he do that? Oh, it was Jesus. It, maybe, I think he was covering his own hide. He, was, he didn't want to get in trouble. He, he really got healed, but I don't, it didn't totally transform him right there. And the Jewish leaders, what are they focused on? They're focused on the rules. And here's the thing, church, a lot of, I can be this way. When I see great things happening sometimes, I match it up to, well, what am I doing? Or I try to minimize something great that I saw happen and go, oh, well, this is the problem with that. If it didn't happen individually in our own life or we can't take credit for it, we minimize it. And we can be like the Pharisees. Verse 16 says, so because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, my father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. And I know he was thinking, verse 12 from Matthew, verse 7, which I put up there, if you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. We need to give mercy, not sacrifice, in our Christian walk. I know I challenge you to get up and go do stuff, but I don't want you to do it out of duty alone. There's duty in life. Jesus had the duty to follow through, to pay for our sin. There was duty involved, but the motive was love. The motive is mercy. When we give to world missions, it's mercy. I desire mercy, love, heart, concern. I care about people and how they're doing. And that's the why for what we do. We need to love mercy and not be self-justifying. It can be too easy for us to justify how others are not doing right and blame others and not take responsibility for what we need to change. You know, as a church, we do some incredible things. I'm so proud of this church. I love being here on the west side. Uh, I love seeing the victories. I love seeing all the dreams that so many of you have. That, that out of heart and love and inspiration, we're seeing some great things happen. There's a lot of getting up. You know, our new Screenland Ministries, getting up and going. Uh, Ken and Lena have the Silicon Beach outreach dream. And of course, we all live in the Silicon Beach. That's the west side. So uh, the tech world is just coming in, right? Uh, the Culver stairs are almost fixed, and it's just going to be a hub of people f around. It's going to be a great place to evangelize right there. People will be there all day long. It's a cool place in town. I love seeing the campus just getting a spark of energy and faith and the interns and Pepperdine's growing and UCLA and there's Bible studies, the SMC. Things are happening. I love it. I love seeing the victory of last week, and I want to thank you on behalf of Naomi for us participating to support the Hope Nyack and to support our missions. You know, we raised like 1500 bucks just at that one event. Amen? It was an awesome time. Thank you guys, all of you, for what you did. Mercy, not sacrifice. And let me tell you, I'm going to close out with this story. Why is this crucial? Our motives are crucial. There's a famous example of what it takes to uh, be motivated to do what's right. And it's a story uh, in graduate seminary that was done in 1973, where they tasked these graduate students with going to preach uh, in a different building from where they gave the direction. And when they went to this building, they had planted an actor in a stairwell who was going to be moaning, he was going to be dressed and disheveled and act like he was hurting and needed assistance. And they told the graduate seminary students who are learning about, you know, full-time ministry work, they told them, you'll be preaching on the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, incidentally, they taught a few of them that they weren't going to teach that. It didn't really matter what they told them, what they found out in the evidence. It didn't matter what scripture they were preaching. It didn't really matter what, uh, you know, what, what, what exactly task they had them to do. Uh, the results were still the same. What made the difference was they told some of the students, hey, you have plenty of time. You've got like a half hour to get over there. Take your time, but go over there now. You need to you know, make sure you're over there before it starts. Others, they said, you're running late. You've got to get there right now. Get over there right away. You've got to get over, you make sure you make it. Some they told, you know, you only have a few minutes. You don't have to rush terribly much, but you, you have a few minutes, but get over there pretty quick. 
And what they found statistically on who helped, they all had to see this guy who was an actor pretending that he was hurt and moaning, and he specifically would cough and moan. He was, he was told to do that in a certain way, and he, he would look, look like he needed assistance. And what they found is all the, the seminary students that were in a rush didn't stop. I think, I, think, I think if I remember, maybe a very, very, very small percentage even, even said anything to him. Most of them just, some of them literally stepped over the guy because they're heading off to go preach their lesson on being the Good Samaritan. <laughs> and if you know that story, it's about not stopping for somebody who's hurting. The people who had the most time, they stopped. And, and it was like 60% of, not all of them stopped, but, you know, here you are, 70, not all of them stopped, but 60% stopped who had time. And so I want us to think about this idea of why we do what we do. If we do it out of duty, 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 we're, we're going to neglect the love. We're going to miss things. The people who had the time, they, they had a, a sense of a people. They care about people. And the analogy, it's not a perfect analogy. I, I have to say, I, when I get focused on something, sometimes I'm, I'm on track mine. And I, I don't want to take it too far. I do think you need to be on time for your appointments and follow through the responsibilities. But when, you're, when your heart is people-focused, when your motive is mercy and love, you are going to accomplish the will of God in a much more effective way. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Today as a church, what we have to live for, to live with, to live within is good news. And we absolutely need to have the attitude of being willing to ask, you know, what, what do we have in our life that we need to change? What do we have in our life that we need to get up from, pick up our mat, and walk? And is our motive love and mercy? Or is it simply duty? As a church, I'm proud of us. We're going to do great things together. I love you. Let's keep it going. Amen. You've just listened to the West Side Podcast. For more information about our ministry, please visit thewestsidechurch.com or laicc.net.